as a park ranger and historian here at Richmond, one of the questions I'm asked a lot is why? Why did the Confederates pick Richmond as their capital? It's only 100 miles from Washington, D.C. Seems kind of stupid that you might do that. Well, the easy answer is the Confederates couldn't afford not to. Richmond had everything they would need. Tobacco factories, ironworks, flour mills, woolen mills, everything they would make for the possibility of fighting a four-year war. So when I say that the Confederates couldn't afford not to, that's what I mean. Where else in the South do you have that kind of industrial capability? It doesn't exist. So Richmond is not only a political capital, but also an industrial and commercial capital as well. In 1861, you've got Jefferson Davis, you've got Robert E. Lee, PGT Beauregard, all crowding into the city, along with office seekers, people looking for jobs, people looking for commissions, all ramping up for this big fight that's going to come. Now remember, at the time, everybody thought this was going to be a very short war. Both sides offered 60-day enlistments. Think about that. 60 days, 90 days, and we'll be done. So it's a sort of creeping realization, oh, we need to do something more than just this ad hoc. We need to create hospitals and prisons and all the things we're going to need to run a government. And that's what they do. A lot of the buildings behind me were used as Confederate hospitals, Confederate prisons. But all of a sudden in 1862, as George B. McClellan's army comes up the Virginia Peninsula, you've got these huge battles that are taking place right outside the city. Robert E. Lee comes to command and jumps McClellan, attacking him north of the city and forcing him away. These are the seven days battles that take place around Richmond. And just imagine standing here while that was going on, you could hear it, you could see it. You could see the flashes of the cannon. You could feel it in your bones as the cannons literally rattled the ground. And for years and years, people have been coming up here to take in the sunset. And now imagine that, this scene of destruction. Lee was able to drive McClellan away and it would be two years before the Union Army would come back. But during that time, the problems arose in the Confederate capital that start to show you that the Confederacy isn't built on solid ground. Inflation takes hold. You've got runaway prices down there in the market. At one point in 1863, people took to the streets to riot because the Confederates could not provide them food. This is often called the bread riot in town, and it took out a lot of the downtown shops and stores where you had not just food, but jewelry and anything that could be carried off was. And it definitely shows you internally that the Confederates have got a real problem at the heart of the Confederacy. This sets the stage for 1864 when U.S. Grant and the Army of the Potomac come once again to the gates of Richmond. This is going to result in the Battle of Cold Harbor. And once again, the people of Richmond could stand here and feel the ground shaking under their feet as a massive battle erupted just 10 miles outside the city. Lee's army was able to hold off the Army of the Potomac. And once again, the Army of the Potomac moved away from Richmond, down to Petersburg this time, where for nine months, the two armies would face off. Battle would come again to the outskirts of Richmond at Fort Harrison in September of 1864, right before the U.S. presidential election. All through this time, you have amazing events going on in Richmond, like a fire at the Tredegar Ironworks right on the eve of Lee's invasion of the North. By 1865, though, the writing was on the wall, with Lee and Grant more or less facing off each other for nine months down at Petersburg. Anybody who was really paying attention to Richmond could see something was going to happen, and something was going to happen soon, and it did on April 2nd, 1865. Lee's lines are broken at Petersburg, and the city began to evacuate itself. Overnight, Confederates moved out. They set fire to a lot of the warehouses in the lower part of the city. That fire got out of control. And the next morning, when the Union Army came in to the city, they became firefighters. They put out the fire and restored order. And ever since then, the U.S. flag has flown over the Capitol behind me. Battlefield preservation movement in regards to the Civil War is probably best viewed as a generational movement. 
In fact, there are about seven different generations of battlefield preservationists uh, that have been operating for the last 150 years. The first is the veteran generation itself that come out of the Civil War and they're, they're limited a little bit by reconstruction when the animosity is such that North and South can't come back together and, and really do much of, of, of anything official and major on these battlefields because they're still fighting over why these battles were fought. Coming in 1890, there was a real watershed event that emerges into what I call the golden age of battlefield preservation, this new generation that would get federal involvement in terms of building these large national military parks at Chickamauga, Chattanooga, uh, Gettysburg, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and a smaller one at Antietam. So this golden age, uh, kind of all the stars align, if you will. You have pristine battlefields, which will no longer be pristine in just a couple of decades with the second industrial revolution. You have the veterans that are, are able to come back and still remember what happened at these battlefields so they can mark it. And then you have Congress that is willing and able to appropriate money. Then we morph into yet another generation that is really carried by the army in the 1920s and early 1930s and they came up with this, this elaborate plan of how to uh, document battlefields, how to preserve battlefields, how to mark battlefields, and they ranked them in order of importance. We get battlefields such as Petersburg, uh, Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Fort Donelson, uh, Stones River during this time period. There is a distinct change though that occurs in 1933 when these battlefields are transferred from the army from the war department to the national park service the war department was military oriented their tours their guidebooks their everything was oriented toward military and toward a military explanation of what happened at these various battlefields and also a military use of these battlefields. They would have soldiers come and camp and bivouac and, and study and, and so on. The National Park Service is a civilian bureaucratic agency that uh, is more interested in interpretation and education to a general population that knows very little about military tactics or military ways. It's in this time period, particularly in the New Deal, that we see battlefields such as Kennesaw Mountain, Appomattox, Manassas, the halt comes with World War II when most all the money and emphasis goes in, into World War II. Post-World War II, the federal government begins to back away from, from, from federal preservation. Uh, in fact, it's, it's uh, interesting that at Fort Sumter, at Pea Ridge, Wilson's Creek, Harper's Ferry, all of these are established by Congress, but they are only established once the individual states acquire the land and give that to the National Park Service. That leads into a new generation in the 1970s and early 80s. Preservation almost comes to a halt in, in these Dark Ages, but the last generation is what I call the Renaissance after the Dark Ages, and that is when local groups begin Begin to push forward and, and take preservation by the horns and that is of course led by uh, the grassroots movement that is the, today's Civil War Trust which is the undisputed leader of, of the preservation movement. The major takeaway from the study of this generational movement is that each of these generations almost in every case had to restart the process on their own. They had to reinvent the wheel, if you will. There was no continuity between the generations. I have every confidence that the Civil War Trust will continue this into the next generation, and if so, they will be able to do something that none of the generations before have been able to do in the last 150 years. Located approximately 30 miles away from the nation's capital, Manassas, Virginia was a key strategic point for both Union and Confederate armies in the early part of the Civil War. It is therefore no surprise that the fields on which I now stand were host to two major Civil War battles, each with a very different character. In the first half of 1861, Confederate troops under Joseph E. Johnston held the Manassas area and areas in the Shenandoah Valley. They were trying to protect the railroads here at Manassas. With Abraham Lincoln anxious to score some early military points, he ordered General Erwin McDowell, commanding the Union Army, to move out of Washington and into Northern Virginia against Johnston's army. The two armies clashed here at Manassas on July 21st, 1861, the bloodiest battle in American history up till that time. The battle begins well for the Union, with Federal forces crossing Bull Run at Sudley's Ford and sweeping Confederates off of Matthews Hill. 
Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard is able to organize a defense on Henry Hill with the help of Generals Francis Bartow, Barnard B., and Thomas Jonathan Jackson, who will earn his nickname Stonewall at this battlefield. The stand on Henry Hill gives the Confederates enough time to bring in reinforcements, troops arriving from the Shenandoah Valley, who then launch a massive counterattack and sweep the Federals from the field across Bull Run and back in the direction of the nation's capital. The ferocity of the fighting here at Bull Run demonstrated to both Northerners and Southerners that victory would not be achieved in a single battle. Union and Confederate forces will meet again on these fields 13 months later in August of 1862. Following his dazzling success on the Virginia Peninsula, Robert E. Lee is eager to use his Confederate army to attack the enemy. Namely, Union General John Pope, who he calls the miscreant Pope, who has been terrorizing Northern Virginia. On August 9, 1862, Stonewall Jackson smacks Pope's troops in the mouth at the Battle of Cedar Mountain, forcing Pope to retreat in the direction of Washington. Pope is hoping to unite his army with McClellan's Army of the Potomac, and Lee desperately wants to stop that reunion from happening. Stonewall Jackson manages to get around Pope's flank and interpose himself between Pope and Washington. He takes a defensive position in an unfinished railroad cut here at Manassas. With Jackson between him and the nation's capital, Pope thinks that he has an opportunity to bag Jackson once and for all. On the night of August 28th, Stonewall Jackson sees Union troops retreating across his front. He rides up to his commanders and tells them, gentlemen, bring out your men, initiating the Second Battle of Manassas. Over the next two days, Pope will launch attack after attack against the unfinished railroad. He will meet some minor successes, but is never able to dislodge Jackson. In the meantime, he has completely neglected the other half of Lee's army under James Longstreet. On August 30th, Longstreet will take advantage of Pope's preoccupation with Jackson and slam into the Union left flank, driving the Federals back in the direction of Washington. Having scored another dazzling victory, Lee now feels confident to take his Confederate army into the North, a campaign that will culminate in the Battle of Antietam. So here at Manassas, we have two battles, two Confederate victories, both of which changed the country's perception of war and had a significant impact on its duration and outcome. On December 16, 1863, the Federal Army will be robbed of one of the finest cavalry officers in the Union service. John Buford was born March 4, 1826, in the slave state of Kentucky. At age 10, his father moved to Rock Island, Illinois, a northern state. John Buford desired a military career. He was able to get an appointment to the United States Military Academy from the state of Illinois in 1844. While he was at this school, he's going to befriend a lot of men who will be both his foes and his colleagues during the Civil War. The class of 1846 will have Thomas J. Jackson, will have George Pickett, and George McClellan. The class of 1847 will have Henry Heath and A.P. Hill, both Confederate generals that Buford faces at the Battle of Gettysburg. He graduates on July 1st, 1848, and he's posted immediately to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. Between 1854 and 1861, John Buford will do service at a wide range of military posts. And at the outbreak of the American Civil War, he'll be with his friend, General John Gibbon. And the two of them will be serving at Fort Crittenden in the Utah Territory when the firing of Fort Sumter occurs on April 12, 1861. Both of these men had Southern ties. And the question becomes, are they gonna go with the Union? Or are they gonna go with the new Confederacy? This was a question that weighed heavy on John Buford's mind. The governor of Kentucky wrote him while he was at Fort Crittenden, and John Buford answered, I told him I was a captain in the United States Army, and I intend to remain one. John Buford will be assigned a cavalry position with General Pope's Army. He'll fight at Second Bull Run. He'll also be involved as the chief of cavalry at both the Battle of Antietam and the Battle of Fredericksburg in December of 1862. In the summer of 1863, he will be promoted to Brigadier General and he'll be given a command of a brigade and then a division in the Army of the Potomac. At 11 a.m. on June 30th, 1863, John Buford's 2,700 men arrive in Gettysburg. His troops will fan out on the western edge of town looking for the Confederates. On July 1st, 1863, the fighting will start at about 7.30 and General Buford himself in the early morning will be up here in the cupola of the Lutheran Theological Seminary. John Reynolds, the head of the Federal Infantry, arrives and shouts up, what's the matter, John? 
and Buford, in famous words, tells him the devil's to pay. Buford will hold on, and Reynolds will bring up the infantry on July 1st. And Buford has been able to allow the Union Army to buy the necessary time they need. And while the Union Army is tactically defeated on July 1, a large part because of Buford's command, the Confederates will have a strategic defeat. They just don't know it yet because the Union Army is able to move back to some higher ground south of Gettysburg. In the fall of 1863, because of exposure and many factors, General Buford will be sick. And so on his deathbed, December 16, 1863, General Buford will be promoted to Major General of the Volunteers. When he's told this, his words were, quote, I wish now I could have lived. I don't think we could have a more fitting epitaph for John Buford than what's said by his friend, General John Gibbon. He was the best cavalryman I ever saw. After the Battle of Chickamauga, the Union Army of the Cumberland retreats to Chattanooga. Confederates under Braxton Bragg pursue and take position on the heights surrounding the city, presenting a formidable obstacle to the Union Army and preventing all but the tiniest trickle of supplies from entering the city. The situation remains unchanged for an entire month, so by the end of October 1863, Bragg's Confederates are no closer to destroying the army they had whipped a month earlier, and the Union Army of the Cumberland, now under General George Thomas, is stuck inside Chattanooga, and even though they have the will to fight, they lack the physical means to break out of the city. However, Chattanooga and the railroads that converge there are essential to the Union war effort, and Abraham Lincoln is ready to move heaven and earth to ensure that the city not only stays in Union hands, but serves as a base of operations for future offensives into the Confederate heartland. Union reinforcements move to Chattanooga in the form of the Union Army of the Tennessee, the victors of Vicksburg under the command of William T. Sherman, and four divisions of the Army of the Potomac fresh from their victory at Gettysburg under the command of Joseph Hooker. But perhaps more importantly, Ulysses S. Grant has been promoted to command all of the Western armies of the United States. Grant himself will oversee the relief effort at Chattanooga. He arrives cold, wet, but ready to work. Now before Grant can lift the siege, he must first bring supplies to the starving Army of the Cumberland. Fortunately, when he arrives, one of his generals, William F. Smith, has a plan to float boats down the Tennessee River to establish a bridgehead on the southern side and connect with the Army of the Potomac units that are arriving. The plan is nuts and rife with danger, but Grant is anxious to take action and greenlights the project. On the night of October 27, 1863, federal troops under the command of William Babcock Hazen float down the Tennessee River, establish a bridgehead at Brown's Ferry, and link up with Hooker's men the next morning. Bragg sees this and wants to stop the relief effort, but James Longstreet's half-hearted attempt to break the Union supply line at Wahatchee is beaten back in the middle of the night of October 28th. In three days, Grant has already begun to unravel the month-long siege of Chattanooga, but Bragg and his generals are too busy arguing with one another to do anything about it. In the face of their inaction, Grant's army grows stronger, gets resupplied, and is ready to take the initiative. On November 23, 1863, Union troops seize high ground called Orchard Knob. The next morning, Hooker's men sweep the Confederates off of Lookout Mountain in a mythical engagement known as the Battle Above the Clouds. On November 25th, Union troops set their sights on Missionary Ridge, the last Confederate stronghold. Sherman will attack from the north, Hooker will sweep up from the south, and the Army of the Cumberland will make a demonstration against the base of Missionary Ridge. But these Cumberland men, who've been sitting besieged in Chattanooga for two months, have ideas of their own. They launch their own attack, not just a demonstration, but a full-fledged assault up the side of Missionary Ridge, sweeping the Confederates off in confusion. Grant's pursuit is stopped at Ringgold Gap on November 27th by a potent rearguard action led by Patrick Claiborne, but the damage has already been done. With Chattanooga firmly in Union hands and Grant's star on its way to its zenith, the stage is set for 1864, and the gateway to the south is wide open. If you were an officer in the Civil War, you might be a line officer, something up to the rank of captain. You might be a field officer. That's going to be your majors, your lieutenant colonels and colonels. But if you rose above that level, you're going to be called a general officer. You could be a brigadier general. You could be a major general. You could be a lieutenant general. And if you were in the Confederate Army, maybe you could even be a full general. Now, some generals had desk jobs. They worked at depots or at camps or at the Confederate or Union capital. But most generals were out in the field. When a general is on a battlefield, 
field. He may or may not have a headquarters. If you're higher up, you're probably going to have one, and it might be in a structure of some sort. It might be in a tent. It might just be wherever you happen to be with a headquarters flag, or it might actually be uh, in the saddle, but you don't want to say it that way. Ask John Pope in 1862 when he said his headquarters would be in the saddle, only to have his critics respond that he had his headquarters where his hindquarters ought to have been. Some battles have no generals at all there, and some of the bigger battles, Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, and others, are going to have more than 100 generals there, and they're going to perform a variety of functions. Some of them are performing what we would call staff work. The chief of staff for an army is usually a general officer. The chief of artillery, sometimes the commissary officer, the chief of ordnance are going to be general officers, but most are going to be out in the field actually fighting battles. They're usually going to perform a variety of tasks commensurate with their rank. The commanding general, for instance, will usually focus on strategy, on keeping their army together, keeping the army safe, and maybe dabbling in tactics a little bit. As you go down from there, the corps commanders and the uh, division commanders might be dabbling in strategy as well, but they're going to get down more to the tactical level, where the brigadier generals are really going to shine on the tactical level, making key decisions. And in performing their functions on battlefields, generals are simply exposed to dangers. Many people would do this high and low. Famously, Winfield Scott Hancock at Gettysburg, riding as the shells dropped around him on July 3rd, 1863. D.H. Hill leading reckless attacks against the sunken road after the Confederates had been forced away from that road, really recklessly exposing himself. In terms of the killed, there's more than 100 Civil War generals killed during the Civil War, depending on how you count them. And there's too many to list, but I always think about Nathaniel Lyon at Wilson's Creek, an army commander. Think about Maxie Gregg at Fredericksburg, who died partly because he had a hearing problem and didn't know what was going on around him. In terms of the wounded, John Bell Hood comes to mind. Wounded at Gettysburg, wounded at Chickamauga. You think of Oliver Otis Howard, wounded at Fair Oaks. And you also have at that same battle, under a different name at Seven Pines, Joseph E. Johnston, desperately wounded and knocked out of the war for a while. And disease, the number one killer in the Civil War, also claimed the lives of generals. Think about one of the most famous ones here at Gettysburg, John Buford. You're going to have several be captured during battles. Think about James J. Archer here at Gettysburg, and he is brought up to his old friend, Abner Doubleday, and he was not happy to meet him at that point. Now, if you go to National Park Service battlefields, you'll see numerous examples of where generals would be killed or mortally wounded. Think about monuments and markers to Bernard B., Albert Sidney Johnson, to Thomas Cobb, to Samuel K. Zook, to Louis Armistead, and others. We can learn because of the accounts where Dorsey Pender was mortally wounded at Gettysburg. We know where Robert Rhodes was killed at the Battle of Third Winchester or Opaken, right next to what is now I-81. So whether marked or not marked, study the Civil War, learn about these generals and you'll learn a little bit more about American history. We are located at the Grand Army of the Republic Monument in downtown Washington, D.C. at 7th and Pennsylvania Avenue. This is the scene of the very first act of Union veteranhood, the Grand Review. On May the 23rd and 24th, 1865, more than 100,000 Union veterans from the Eastern and Western armies paraded down this street, beyond sidewalks choked with civilians, ready to celebrate the end of the war, ready to celebrate Union victory. The men in the marching ranks, however, they weren't so sure. The road ahead was uncertain. Americans, of course, were as unprepared for the peace as they had been for the war itself. There was no Veterans Administration. There was only a nascent pension bureau. Not until 1890 would we have a Dependent and Disability Pension Act that would establish an old age pension for all disabled Union veterans. Union veterans, they came back to a society that was ready to move quickly beyond the painful issues of the war. While some were able to adjust into civilian society with ease, others were not. Divorce rates spiked, unemployment rates soared, suicides became not uncommon. Many veterans moved out to isolated veteran colonies in the West, places like Gibbon, Nebraska and Gettysburg, South Dakota. Billy Yank might have won the war, but he couldn't bear the peace that followed. His old adversary, Johnny Reb, he returned home, as the historian Jim Martin has pointed out, to southern communities that keenly understood the war and its costs, all of his sacrifices. Southern states and localities provided pensions and soldiers' homes, prosthetic appliances. Johnny Reb's greatest struggle was not civilian reception after the war, but rather adjusting to a post-emancipation society. In some cases, he joined up with the ranks of white supremacist terrorist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Others fled south to Mexico or Brazil. 
But many others remained at home to get to the work of physical reconstruction. They turned the heaps of rubble produced by the war into the cities of the New South. All of that onerous work may explain why it took so long for Confederates to establish fraternal organizations. Not until 1889 would the United Confederate Veterans be founded in New Orleans, Louisiana. Not until 1893 would they publish a periodical, The Confederate Veteran, from Nashville, Tennessee. On the federal side, fraternal organizations got to work almost immediately after the war. On the fourth anniversary of the first day at Shiloh, Dr. Benjamin Franklin Stevenson, a regimental surgeon from the 14th Illinois Volunteers, founded the GAR on the principles of fraternity, charity, and loyalty. The GAR was the only integrated fraternal society in late 19th century America. While there were segregated posts, there were many more integrated posts, and national membership in the organization was colorblind. The GAR would do important work, charitable work, in providing money for needy and, in some cases, homeless veterans, their widows, and their orphans. And together, collectively, they would help to remind the nation what exactly had been at stake in this war. In the years and decades that went on, Union and Confederate veterans would meet up in battlefield reunions. The two most important blue-gray reunions were held on the Gettysburg battlefield, one in 1913, the other in 1938. These reunions produced memorable images of wrinkled old soldiers clasping hands across the stone wall at Cemetery Ridge. But those images noiselessly effaced the enduring sectional bitterness and lingering animosities produced by this war. Indeed, bitterness and animosities that would long outlive the last veterans. The last confirmed Confederate veteran, an Alabamian who fought at Hatcher's Run, would die in 1951. The last Union veteran, named Albert Wilson, was a drummer boy in a Minnesota heavy artillery regiment, died in August of 1956 at the age of 109. After he was buried in Park Hill Cemetery in Duluth, Bruce Catton, the great Civil War writer, remarked that a window into the Civil War past had closed forever. Indeed, the ordeal of the Civil War veteran was over at last. Here today to talk to you about the evaluation of terrain on battlefields. We cannot overestimate the impact of terrain that it has on a battle. So what is terrain? Well it's the ground, it's the size, shape, and location of the topography and the intervening water courses and roads. At the strategic level we're talking about mountains and valleys and rivers and coastlines and cities. At the tactical level we're talking about hills, ridge lines, creeks, villages, farmers fields, and the fences that surround them. In essence, terrain is the stage upon which the military pageant is played out. Now, when we think about this, commanders must evaluate the limitations and opportunities of terrain all the time. And as they consider the advantages and disadvantages of terrain and how that might impact military operations, that's called terrain evaluation or appreciation. And they always have to add into that the season, the time of day, and the weather. Now, commanders really have three ways to evaluate terrain. One, they can do map study. If you think about Thomas Stonewall Jackson and the power he had by having a very talented map maker in Jedediah Hotchkiss, that's one way. The other way, you can send out patrols or reconnaissance. How many times had Robert E. Lee looked at his cavalry chief, Jeb Stewart, and said, find me a good piece of ground? And then the final way, commanders can walk the ground themselves. I imagine when George Gordon Meade arrives at Gettysburg after the first day's fight, he meets with his generals and will spend the rest of that night riding the high ground that his army will stand on for the next two days. Now there's some tools that those commanders have that we can use today. One is the acronym COCOA. C-O-C-O-A. The first C is critical or key terrain. This is terrain that if either side occupies, they'll have a distinct advantage. The O stands for observation and fields of fire. Terrain that helps you see, that would be the observation, or terrain for which you can put on your infantry and artillery, and now they can cover those fields with shot and shell. The next C is for cover and concealment. Concealment means terrain that blocks something from being able to observe you, and cover is terrain that keeps you out of somebody's field of fire. And in the Civil War, where everything is a direct fire weapon, oftentimes cover and concealment is one and the same. 
The next O is obstacles. This is any terrain that hinders or stops movement or maneuver. And we always have to understand obstacles in terms of the units within the Army. So a thick forest might prevent artillery from operating in there, but not have any impact to infantry. And finally, we'll talk about avenues of advance. This is terrain that facilitates movement or maneuver. It can be for retreat or advance. Now, when commanders consider that terrain, they must always do so in light of their mission, the operation, the units that they have assigned, and their level of command. Now, the impact of terrain on the Civil War was great. In fact, the names of the pieces of terrain that impact in Civil War battlefields ring through our nation's history. Whether it's the Henry's Culps or Champions Hill, Seminary Cemetery or Missionary Ridge. We think about Marie's Heights or Boulevard's Heights, Kennesaw Mountain or South Mountain, the Valley Turnpike. Even when we come to simple things like the cornfield, the wheat field, the peach orchard, and the hornet's nest, the West Woods, and the wilderness. Now, these are named pieces of terrain, but on every battlefield, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of individual pieces of terrain that made all the difference in how those battles turned out. So my charge to you is this. When you visit a Civil War battlefield, the first time you get on a new piece of ground, stop. Make a 360 degree turn and evaluate the terrain. And when you do, two things will happen. One, you'll understand the battles better. And two, you'll be looking at that ground with the exact same eyes that those commanders and soldiers who fought there did.